Hello everybody and welcome to the LP of Muramasa the Demon's Blade. There's a lot of fucking Japanese mythology in this game. First one right here in the title screen. The legend of Sengo Muramasa's swords are strong enough to cut leaves in the air. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the attract mode, that was really neat. Another neat thing if you were paying attention. Another legend of Muramasa's blades were that while all swords made back then were typically made with a weird uniform shimmer, all of Muramasa's blades had very async not as asymmetrical sword shines anyways enough about trivia here's the start of a new game this game has three modes fury right here is unlocked by beating the game it is a one-hit death mode don't play it <laughs> chaos is more of an action game mode legend is more of an rpg mode we're gonna be playing chaos because fuck it it's fun This game actually has two stories unlike previous games from vanillaware we had the story of momohime and kisuke I will be playing both in tandem, Momohime on Tuesdays, Kisuke on Saturdays. Now here's the tutorial, we're not gonna do it, cause I'm just gonna explain shit as we fly. Now, this game starts off with kind of a cold opening. You start as a character, there's a barrier going blocking one way, and then you go another way. This game also has light platforming. It's not really required for anything, but in order to get certain items and uh, currency in this game, you have to platform. One of the currency in this game is souls. No, this is not a souls game. Souls is used for two things. Recharging your uh, item crash and being currency for making a sword. Now here's combat. Combat has a lot of fucking depth to it and you can do so many things. You have an air dash. You have an item crash. When, you're sh when your uh, weapon select shines, you can item crash. That front flip, that's a guard breaker. It can be used to break guards and to do a lot of fucking damage. A lot of the content in this game is broken up into two things, traveling and combat, with the meat of the game being combat. The platforming is very basic platforming, mainly meant to get souls, items, and show off the area. And there's a lot of good things to show off, like this very beautiful and lush forest environment. Now, as I was mentioning before, there's a lot of things in combat, probably things we're not going to see as I explain them. I, weapon select. You have three weapons that you can choose from. We also have things like there. We have a ground slash, that little sliding ground slash that we did that can be used to pop enemies in the air. But there are other better ways to pop people in the air, like that air dash you often see me do. Also, weapons have their own unique attacks. You just saw Misty Slash. Every weapon has its own unique special attack, using it consumes weapon durability, but it is good for a variety of things I will discuss later. Now here is where we learn that each area has items. If you take a look at the minimap, you'll see that there is a orange basket. It's probably hard to see with the encoder, but it's still there. You can get items in this game. For the most part, they're basically supplies to restock you if you ever need stuff. But very so often, there is a rare item to pick up. Now, there are two weapons in this game. You have the very basic short sword, which is known as a Tachi in Japan. Then you have the no Dachi, which is this slow motherfucker here. It does a lot of damage, but it's really slow, and I hate it. At the end of every encounter, you get bonuses for how well you do. Oftentimes, the, bo the uh, better the bonus, the better the EXP rate. If you do well enough, you could get EXP really well and really quickly. I fuck up a lot. Now I mentioned a lot of times in my LP I love parallax scrolling, you see that in this area, but more than here, this shows why I hate the fucking Nodachi. It is slow as balls. If you miss any attack, your wind up takes forever. And more than often you'll be blocking instead and then you'll take damage and then everything's terrible. So if you ever see me play this game, more than often I will be using a uh, Tachi. That right there was Divine Moon, it's basically a flying uppercut. Good for setting up combo- good for blocking projectiles, it's really bad at setting up combos. But yeah, you can really see parallax scrolling here and it looks so nice. Another way to get items is to just loot houses. One of the big themes in Vanilla War games is you can just pick up stuff on the fly, and it's really good because earlier in the video I wasted a bamboo flask, and after using that longsword, I had to use another one. You can see how good the regular sword is just because you're doing many attacks, and while they don't do as much damage, 
you're, you're attacking roughly three times as fast, and that just more than makes up for the difference. There's also an attack, which is basically a drop slash. Really good for just resetting combos, but uh, I don't use it as often as I used to. Mainly because the hitbox for a drop attack is really short. Now here is an enemy that causes people a lot of problems. It is Samurai. Samurai have the ability to block. This is where the charge attack comes in. That little front flip that you see me do right there, that is intended to break the sword of a Samurai. Now you could do many other things to break the sword of a Samurai. You could use your quick draw slash, you could just wail on them, you could spam sword techniques. But the most reliable way to do it is to use your Guard Crusher. Now we fight a lot of ninjas here initially, but as you progress the game and through each different campaign, you get new and unique enemies per campaign. Ninjas are just kind of the enemy vanillaware threw in as a kind of filler to each area. If you have a random encounter, more than often it's going to be ninjas. Which is a shame, because ninjas don't really engage traditionally like this. They're more assassins than outright combatants. I mean, I guess, the idea, I guess the idea is that ninjas only attack when it's opportune to them, and that's why they're in mobs, but they never... They're basically weak to the uh, plow for us. Also, if you saw a while ago, we got a big pose soul. That is basically ten souls in one. Really good to get, and it instantly charges your item crash. I call it item crash, but it's basically the tr it's basically the uh, stereotypical quick draw slash from most kung fu movies. Now, there's one thing I really like that this game does. It knows how to use color. Notice how that we went from a very lush and colorful field to now a purple and drearily looking dead village. Vanillaware is comprised of 60% artists, and they know what the hell they're doing, which is awesome in some ways. Color is a great thing that this game has, and you'll see a lot of color. And one trick I like to do whenever I'm in trouble is I like to quick slash into weapon techniques. One thing I forgot to mention is that weapon techniques have invincibility frames. If you use it well, you can use your weapon technique to get out of trouble. Now here's a neat little callback to Odin Sphere right here. This little spherical area? Whenever you played Odin Sphere, a lot of the maps had a sort of circular design to the camera. And this is a neat little callback to that. And you also see it a little bit more often, not enough to get obnoxious, but enough to remind you, oh yeah, Odin Sphere was the thing, that's cute. And now, after about 10 minutes of beating the shit out of ninjas, we get plot. Uh, right now I'm showing off here how equipment works. Equipment, you get three different swords at once, and you also get an accessory. There's no other real equipments. The other equipment is item shortcut. That little thing on the top right, you could equip items to there to where you could quick access them in combat and use them. And that's the only time you could use combat items in combat. Wow, that was bad. There are a lot of items you could get in this game. We won't see any this episode, because now we are going to a boss fight. And now we get plot. Now you probably noticed right now that Moehime looks very different than what she looked like before, and there's a reason for that. I also like this graveyard. You see this graveyard in a lot of movies, both traditional and animated. I love the flooded graveyard thing, it looks so cool. You'll also notice that one thing Vanillaware loves to do is exaggerate. Because look at all these gravestones. There is not enough space for the bodies for these gravestones. In fact, there's no place to put up any offerings to the dead in this graveyard, where it's just elbow to elbow tombstones. But that's just how Vanilla ro Vanillaware rolls. They really like to exaggerate things, and it gives their games a lot of personality. But yeah, we are in cutscene mode right now. As I mentioned, Vanillaware loves exaggerations. You look at this monk, you instantly think, Wow, that's fucking evil looking. 
Even though that's supposed to be a Buddhist, that is an evil looking monk. I also want that hat. I don't know why, but ever since I've been exposed to, like, Japanese movies and journals, I just really want that hat. Because it looks so fun and goofy. And here is our primary antagonist of Momohime's story. It's Rankai, the monk. Got some pretty mean looking eyebrows there. And finally, we have this little green angry ball of ectoplasm. What's this about? Yeah, this is the story of Momohime, who is being possessed by the evil swordsman Jinkuro. Jinkuro has his own reason for possessing people and stealing their body, but for now he's stuck with Momohime's pe petite body. And he doesn't take it lightly. Because for whatever reason, whenever Jinkuro possesses Momohime's body, Momohime grows armor out of nowhere. Now this is a thing that is present in Japanese culture, the whole one body, one soul thing. And to wit, in, in a lot of Japanese religious culture, everything has a soul. In some ways we'll see that across this game, but for now we're just going to be seeing it between Momohimi and Jinkuro. And this is another thing that you see in a lot of Japanese culture, the one, the Cyclops Blue Monk. I'll try to figure out more about it, but I don't really know much about this specifically. But yeah, this is our first boss fight. First boss fight, the Blue Monk. He's relatively easy initially because all of his attacks are predictable. He does have a lot of tricks up his sleeve though, like that fire pillar that is really painful. That jump right there, you're gonna see me dodge that a lot because there is an attack. There are two attacks in fact, that freak me the fuck out and I always fall for, but they don't happen until the second half of the fight. Like right there, I'm actively dodging because I'm expecting an attack but it's not happening. That belly flop is probably his strongest attack but it's also the most predictable, it does a lot of damage. But if you played a video game in your life, you'll dodge it because you'll see it coming. For the most part though, he is the introductory boss. He's actually not that hard just because of how slow he is and how lumbering he is. If you're really good, you can chain a lot of attacks into each other. Like one of my favorite things to do in this boss fight is to chain a down attack into a guard breaker because, because of the blue monk size, the guard breaker will hit every attack on it. And here's the attack I'm talking about! This thing sucks! It's not only a homing jump, it'll follow you no matter where you go, but it also fires a boatload of projectiles that will break your weapon if you guard long enough. Yeah, here I'm deciding to use the long sword, which is not as effective as I thought it was. It does a lot of damage per capita, but in general it's still slower and you won't be doing damage in the long run. And that's the other attack! The fire uppercut. That thing comes out so fast and I can never predict it. Right here I'm getting beat to shit just because I can't tell what the attack is and it's very frustrating. One thing about Blue Monk though is after you do a couple combos, he is really easily stunned by a special attack. So if you if you use Misty Step, you'll be able to stun him in the middle of a combo. Now here's a good example of special techniques, invincibility frames. If you, were, if you were paying attention to the back of Momohime, you would have seen fireballs hitting her, but she still didn't take damage. Also, if you combo really well, you could juggle the Blue Monk, but it's really hard because he's so heavy. Now there's another example of invincibility frames. 
I don't use special techniques a lot because it doesn't do as much damage, but if you know what you're doing, you could actually predict and use special techniques to just get in the bosses when they're in the middle of a cooldown of their attack. Also, one thing to know about special attacks, while they are useful, they do not do any damage, well, they don't do as much damage as a regular combo. In fact, I would suffice to say that special attacks are the weakest attack in the game. They are mainly, mainly meant for combo expansion and utility. And with that, the Blue Monk's dead. Now, an interesting thing about the localization of this game. When it was made for the Nintendo Wii, there was a very poor plot localization, but the swords were all left untranslated and it left kind of a neat air to it. In this game, the script is a lot better, but they translated the swords, which makes the sword kind of lose a lot more impact, in my opinion. And yeah, here is more plot coming up, but not really. Basically, Rankai managed to capture Momohime's soul, and if her soul dies, then Momohime's body dies, and then Jinkuro will be out of luck. Now here we are introduced to a pe half of a pair of unique characters and game mechanics. This is Kongiku. She is a fox deity and a very good example of egregious design. Basically, the thing about Kangiku is she likes Jinkuro, and she's more than willing to help him out in his affairs. Why? We never really figure out, honestly. Now here is where the blacksmith comes into play. This is the... We basically use the soul of the smith Muramasa. I don't know if his name is Sengo or Senji. I don't know if that's a change on the developer's part. But yeah, we basically use the ever... The perpetually blacksmith soul Muramasa to craft a sword for use in this game. And it says right here, this is really cool. The souls you collect in this game, their hatred fuels the forge for Muramasa to make better swords. That is a really good line. That is the primary reason you are collecting the souls in the platforming segments. You are getting souls to make better swords. And you're gonna need those souls, because out of all the things you get in the game, souls are the thing you are always in a deficit of. And a little bit of flavor here. We can't progress until we talk to everybody in these segments. So let's talk to these foxes. I like this bullshit right here. Oh yeah, well the blood the bloodlust makes you insane? Well I've mastered the Oboro style, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah, whatever. And here's a little bit of plot expla explaining game mechanics. It is said that a sword of Muramasa is so bloodthirsty that it must draw blood once it's uh, wielded. And its bloodlust is so strong that the sword will eventually repair itself so it can cut again. There is actually some merit to the legend of a, a Muramasa blade wanting to draw blood, and it's involved with a an assassination of, I think, a noble or his son. I can never remember which. Yeah, this has explained the pseudo-metroidvania elements of this game. The game is somewhat free to explore, but there are barriers blocking your way, and the only way to get past those gates is to fight a boss, get their Muramasa blade, and then break the barrier. Right now, with the sword we got from the Blue Monk, we can break red barriers.
And that's the end of chapter one. Normally I would end the video here, but we have a couple new things to explore. The first one is the central mechanic of this game. Behold, Senji Muramasa. The interesting thing about Muramasa's design is that typically in most ghost stories in Japan, ghosts will never have feet, and you can kind of see that in that design as well. But for some odd reason, Muramasa doesn't have hands. I mean, they're there, but they're basically invisible, and they're wielding his blacksmith's tools, so he could put he could put fire to steel and forge away forever. That's always been a neat little design. I also like the fire in his back, which is basically the fire of his passion for making these swords. That's probably bullshit on my end, but whatever. Our first sword, the peony blade. It's a long sword. Fuck. Okay. Uh, shit, I can't wield this one. Maybe later. The Water Witch Blade. We'll discuss how to forge weapons in detail later on. But for now, we have three new weapons, one of which we can't wield, another one I don't like. However, I will say that whenever I get a new weapon, I will make the effort to demonstrate it. I can't promise that, but I will at least try. Oh yeah, we also got four blades, actually. One of them which we can't use because we don't have the strength for it. But yeah, that's uh, chapter one of Momohime for Muramasa the Demon's Blade. Next up, Kisuke. I'll see you folks later.